defining restorative justice. It has, I think, so many different definitions uh, depending on who is discussing it. And hopefully our panelists today can give all of us a deeper understanding of what they mean by restorative justice. Um, so joining us on our first panel is Judge Colleen Sheehan, the circuit, uh, retired judge from the Circuit Court of Cook County. And I will leave it to each panelist briefly to tell us about your work in restorative justice. Bios are available uh, if folks want to read deeper and uh, want to contact any of the panelists or speakers or outbreak room uh, coordinators uh, throughout the day, but I don't wanna take up a lot of time uh, in a symposium like this, reading everybody's bios, we'd have to, by the time I got finished, we'd have to break for lunch. So I will leave the panelists to introduce themselves to you. Uh, also joining us is Professor Mikhail Lyabonsky from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And hopefully, and any moment now joining us should be Minister and Attorney uh, M. Michelle Day from Nehemiah Trinity Rising. Uh, and with that, uh, panelists, uh, please, defining restorative justice. What is restorative justice? Uh, Judge Sheehan, you, would you start us off and uh, we'll take it from there. Good morning, everyone. It is very nice to be here. It's impressive to see so many people. I want to thank uh, the University of uh, Chicago, the clinic, Professor Conyers, all the students, and particularly Julie and Ben, for organizing um, this and bringing us uh, two together, even though we are in somewhat of a, uh, a, a challenge and we have to do this using technology. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful blessing. Um, and it may not be the best way, as Professor Conyers said, to get together in community, but it's what we've got. So uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna do something. I, um, the panel is set up where it, we have uh, an, acade uh, an academic, and we have um, uh, someone who is going to speak uh, regarding some community, that would be um, uh, Michelle Day and myself, uh, was, was chosen, I'm, I'm assuming, for any kind of expertise I might have as it relates to the courts. So what I'd like to do this morning in the allotted time that I have, and you have to be careful because I start talking about this and I could go on forever. I don't know if somebody wants to wave if my time's running out, but what I'd like to do this morning is kind of give you a definition, not in the sense of showing you any kind of PowerPoint or giving you a, a, a dictionary definition of restorative justice, but kind of give you a, a definition based upon uh, what, what my experience was and the traje trajectory of the journey of what it took to go from not having a restorative justice court, community court, to having one. Um, hopefully there'll be some uh, I can give you a little bit about how I got there, my introduction to restorative justice, uh, you know, what it took to kind of create that court, what were some of the successes, what were some of our challenges, and then maybe talk a little bit about the future. That's a lot in 15 minutes. And I'm hopeful that um, during uh, the time that I'm speaking with you, it might uh, spark an interest or, or you might think of a question or something like that. And I'm happy to answer any questions as all the panel members are. Uh, and I'm happy to provide my email if you want to have a more in-depth conversation. Uh, first, you know, let me just give you a little bit of information about myself um, so you can understand maybe why I was asked to be here on a Saturday morning at you know, 9.15 to talk to you. Um, my name is Colleen Sheehan and I am a retired Cook County Circuit Court judge. I was uh, on the bench for nearly 20 years. All of the time that I spent on the bench was in the adult and or the uh, juvenile justice division. Um, I went to the juvenile justice division in about 2007, and I kind of went a little bit apprehensively. I just, um, I, you know, I didn't know if it would be a good fit. I had no idea that it would really change my life personally and professionally for the better, um, but it, 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 was, it was a journey for sure. Um, 
One of the things I noticed when I was in juvenile court was I just noticed, you know, really quite frankly, how much sadness there was. If you, it, it had every element of society, uh, all the all the issues we have, all the challenge with, challenges that we have seem to show up in juvenile court with regard to education and poverty and violence and addiction. Uh, the other thing I noticed was that there were children that were being murder. There were children who were on my probation during the first year of that I was in juvenile court. Five children were murdered that were on my probation. And it, it just was so striking. It was so such a profound experience that for myself, I just kind of kept looking around thinking, you know, what can we do about this? Well, uh, you know, basically what I did to do about this was, you know, it, I just said yes to a lot of things. Um, I think that's sort of the first step in getting involved. And that's sort of the first step on any journey is saying yes. And I had um, the, the juvenile probation department, it, I, I loved them. They were wonderful people, so dedicated. And they asked me if I would speak to some students. I did speak to some students and I, when I think about this, this is just so amazing where we are here today. We were so ahead of our, our time really, um, uh, but the, they spoke to a community of students who really wanted to know about the police and how they got away with what they got away with. And I just was so taken by their passion. And this is before cell phones had movies and pictures and they wanted to know about this. And I, they were so passionate about this. I thought, well, I, I wanted them to speak to police and I wanted the police to speak with them. And I kind of intuited a round table. I didn't know about restorative justice at all, um, but I just knew that it was important that people speak to one another and they could speak to one another in a really authentic way. So that's the first thing I'd say about restorative justice. To me, restorative justice is about having conversation in a really authentic and, and honest and respectful and safe way. Uh, I just, um, you know, from that conversation with the students, I was introduced to some folks um, in, in Cook County that um, ran circles. Um, and we just kept doing that. We just kept bringing folks together, institutional um, uh, system folks and community uh, together. I know Judge Evans was one of the participants when we had uh, an all day seminar, he came in, he sat in a circle. And this is, I, you know, probably 2007 or eight or, you know, early on. So it's, it was a, it's a long journey. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, and I think in about 2014, Judge Evans called me and said, you know, some of the work that you're doing in restorative justice, do you think that that would translate to the emerging adult population. And immediately I just said, yes, it would. I didn't really have any idea about uh, how it could get done, but I was so excited that he had called and that he had wanted to do that. Um, I asked him if he you know, would like um, some inf more information, uh, a little bit of a, a, a memo on, on, on how, to, how to do that. And it's so good to see one of my panelists here, Michelle uh, Day. Um, she was one of the originals. It was, it was myself and Nancy Michaels who really created a vision action plan on how we could more fully implement restorative justice in Cook County. And we took that notion. We took how, how are we going to take restorative justice? How are we going to combine the courts with that? And so we Set. We've been, Michelle knows, we were in my chambers at, you know, sometimes six o'clock in the morning, writing, pounding away. It was really one of the great pleasures that I had on the bench was to do that, is to write this vision action plan. I gave it to Judge Evans and Judge Evans said, okay, keep going, keep going. And we did that. We went into the community, we went to the community um, and we met with restorative justice community leaders, other community leaders. And at first, I, you know, as Michelle knows, they were not uh, all uh, that interested in uh, having the, 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 the system, the court system, get involved in restorative justice. And I was kind of shocked by that. I thought, why not? I mean, this just seems like such a great thing to do. And 
what they were concerned about was they didn't want the 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 court system to kind of take over what is essentially a community thing and then so we went back to the drawing board we would write some more and we would do all this you know kind of talking and that's another thing about restorative justice it's something that just doesn't happen overnight you have got to put the time in you have got to put the uh, time to build relationships um, without that it just doesn't work and i don't think i would have been able to 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 help start this unless i had put a decade of work in while i was in juvenile court speaking in the community saying yes showing up to everything that i could within the community so one of the things that came out and this is a speaker later on that is i i see uh, father david kelly he said well you know if maybe if it was in the community you know the community would would have more buy into this and we just kept going back and changing things and as we talked about it which was kind of an interesting thing we were talking about it and you know the community would get some community members would get very excited and it kind of left our little pod michelle and nancy and i and then people took it over they decided what they thought it would look like and i really had not i didn't have authority to create a court only judge evans could do that and so I went to Judge Evans and I, I just said, you know, I, I, would, I would leave these community meetings sometimes thinking, uh, I don't know if I should be out here doing this. And I, you know, and I, I would speak to Judge Evans a lot. And I said, Judge, can you please, can I please get in front of like the state's attorney, the sheriffs, the, you know, all the system people, the police, all the system people. And he graciously invited me to a meeting. It was well received. I looked at him at the end of that meeting and I was like, well, I, you know, I need some sort of permission. It was really weird. You know, how do you, how do you get this going? And he looked at me and he just said, go Colleen, go do it. So uh, we went about, you know, doing that. Judge Evans was able to secure for the Cook County a grant in 2000, I believe 16. And through that grant, that was really the thing that just kind of brought, um, brought the court and the, the creation of the court really rolling. We partnered with the, um, the North Lawndale community. And what, what we did was we created a, a, a structure. And that's the other thing I wanted to talk briefly about is when you are deciding to do something, um, creating a, a restorative justice, and I'll, I'll use the word program, it's not quite the right word, but if you're doing that, structure is important because once you create that structure, it's hard to it's hard to do something else. And here's what I mean by that: we were very adamant about making sure that the community and the system voices were equal, that they were shared, that all these decisions would have both input, and that they would they would have uh, both the both sets of voices. We created a steering committee, and we had work groups, and we went about trying to figure out. How does this look? What does this look like? So we figured out how does a case from arrest get all the way into the restorative justice community court? We figured that out. We worked on that and um, we, uh, we, we created something that we thought was um, good for the community, could be transformative for the courts. And essentially what we did was uh, emerging adults, 18 to about 26, uh, arrested, they could be arrested for a felony or a misdemeanor, but if most of these cases we have were felonies, they would, um, they would, they were arrested, they would, if, if they qualified uh, to be in the court based upon some objective criteria that had to do with our grants and what the agreements were with the state's attorney's office and the courts, they could come into our court, the community would agree to uh, facilitate peace circles, and then we would discuss what would repair the harm from crime? Now that is uh, another obviously important aspect of restorative justice is repairing the harm from crime. And the way I think we did that in the courts was to bring community and um, together with the, the person harmed, the person who committed the harm and brought them together in peace circles to sit and learn about each other, hear about each other's um, stories, and then decide what would repair that harm from crime. Once that harm from crime was repaired, um, that, that we had a repair of harm agreement that was written, it would be reviewed by the court. We would uh, 
make sure that, you know, if we had any, we didn't, we didn't know what went on in those circles because it was confidential, but we reviewed them. They were uh, most always accepted. And then the community agreed that they would go about doing what was necessary to help the young uh, person um, repair the harm from the crime that they had caused. Um, I know 15 minutes is such a short period of time and I wanna make this um, point. Uh, I think with the time maybe that I have left, um, one of the things that I wished we had done when we had started the court, we had a two year grant. One, is, one was for design and implementation and then the other was to you know, have the court up and running. What I think we, uh, if, if I had my way, and I would have probably spent the entire year just building relationships, just doing that. When we, the other thing is we created a structure, the steering committee as we called it. And in that structure, I, don't, I think we needed to add a, a, a committee, if you will, about restorative justice, about relationship building. And I think Michelle and Nancy would have been the two pe perfect people to run that particular uh, committee and to be on that steering committee. Um, we, you know, we didn't do that. We tried to build relationships, but it's really hard to you know, build relationships, try to figure out what the structure of the court looks like. Um, and the relationship building is so important. And the reason why it's so important is because if you are going to endeavor to engage in restorative justice, by nature, there's probably a conflict. It's, you know, it's not, you know, everybody says, you know, I, we want patience, we want honesty, we want, um, we want integrity. Everybody agrees on the values usually, but what, you know, what I think is important is to figure out what is the structure what, what do you do when the conflict comes to really prepare for that conflict? Because that conflict will absolutely come. And you, I think, have to be, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, I don't know if it's sort of like having a, 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 a prenup agreement before the divorce. I mean, you, you need to know what, what, you know, the structure that you're going to use when, when the conflict comes, because if you don't have that in place, you're scrambling around, you're trying to figure that out, feelings are hurt. Um, and so I think that's an important thing. I know I'm probably, you know, I don't know if anybody's keeping time and I don't wanna, you know, eke over into anybody else's time on this panel, but, um, I, you know, I, I, I think that relationship part is so important. Now, you also have to, when you're, when you're trying to, um, when you're trying to integrate restorative justice, which is kind of by definition a community, a, a community uh, endeavor, with something that's an institution or a system like the court, it is extremely difficult because you have to you have to have there there's certain um, there's certain requirements or, or parameters that you have to abide by when you are a court. Uh, there's budgets, uh, you know, you can talk all you want about relationships, but, you know, people who are in charge of the budgets have to be responsible to the community and they have to kind of know, uh, and I mean the larger community, the taxpayer community, they have to know that those dollars are being spent wisely and you have to have oversight. And some of this stuff seems like it's incongruent with restorative justice. Um, I, I'm, you know, I, and it, there are challenges for sure in that regard. Uh, I think we we met with um, uh, those challenges within the the restorative the Cook County restorative justice community. Um, there were challenges for sure, but we had successes that were just beautiful, lovely, wonderful. I mean, we had people singing in open court, sharing their art, uh, people applauding at at the young people's successes. I know that uh, Judge Evans has uh, expanded the restorative justice community courts. Um, and I know that I have received uh, communication from some of the people that were working, working tirelessly, volunteering their time. And I know that they are now, you know, hired by the county, which I'm really happy to see that, that, that it's expanded in that regard too. Bringing the community in um, it, it is, is a wonderful thing. Um, I, uh, Okay, we're at 15 minutes, so I yes. want to sort of um, uh, wind down. Um, basically, um, 
my my definition of restorative justice is authentic communication you know through and getting to know each other and there's no better way of doing that than telling stories with each other um it's not fast always it's not always easy but it can be very effective and it can be a, a beautiful thing i thank you for listening i know i've kind of you know, condensed, you know, a decade's worth of work into 15 minutes. So, um, you know, my, my email is Colleen Sheehan at Mac.com. If anyone has any other questions that need, you need to go deeper with, and I'm also happy to answer questions at the end of this Q and A. Thank you very much. And it's so good to see you, Michelle. <laughs> well, thank you for having me here. Thank you for organizing this event. It's in many ways, a sign of the progress of the restorative movement. The University of Chicago Law School is organizing events like this, and I'm really happy to be part of it. I have some definitions. Um, I am looking forward to sharing them with you. Uh, I do it in the form of stories, and the stories have sort of been developed with the assumption that we're all in the same physical space. So let's pretend that we are, and, and you'll see why that, um, that little bit of pretense is, is necessary. So one of the ways I like to think about restorative justice is to imagine that somebody makes, uh, makes a mess, a spill, that we're all in the same room and some of us have drinks and maybe as the person who's speaking in this moment, I'm walking around the room and I accidentally knock, uh, knock over somebody's cup of coffee and, and it spills and everybody sort of starts to move out of the way and maybe somebody towards the back of the room will, um, will walk out of the room and go get some paper towels. And maybe somebody else who's sitting near the spill will um, move their bags and some other things so that they don't get uh, wet and stained. Um, which, it, but the, the point I'm trying to say is that a variety of people will kind of spring into action as a response. And the paper towels will come and, and maybe somebody else in the room will reach out um, to take a few and help clean up the mess. Um, and meanwhile, hopefully I'm, I, as the person who, who made the mess, uh, hopefully I'm doing something useful, um, maybe moving some things, maybe just pausing so that other people can do it. Uh, but I'm not necessarily the one doing all of the cleaning up, um, even though I'm the one that made the mess. And so this is one of the parallels, one of the analogies that I have to restorative justice. It's, it's, it's a mess in the community. Um, it's a mess in relationships. And other people, the entire community has the responsibility. The person who made the mess has the most obligation, the most responsibility. Uh, but other people have created <clears throat> conditions for the mess to happen. Other people are impacted by the mess. And for those reasons, it makes sense that that other people might contribute to, to cleaning things up. And that's what restorative justice is. And then one of the last bits of this story that, that I wanna say is, you know, the paper towels come and people get to, <coughs> people get to work. And in a few minutes, that spot where the box was spilled, well, that's now the cleanest part of the room. It's not gonna stay that way forever. Uh, because we know that as humans, we're good at making more messes. But for a little bit, that's the cleanest part. And I think that is also what restorative justice does. Um, it creates, it, you know, it cleans things up. It's not permanent. Uh, but for a while, those relationships, those part of our relationships, uh, they can be a little bit, a little bit better. So that's one of the ways I like to talk about restorative justice. Another way is to make the distinction between restorative justice and what we're all more familiar with, which is punitive justice. And, uh, and then I like to do this, let me see if I can pull this off on, on Zoom. Uh, I like to do this with my hands. I'm gonna see if I can stand up. I think, yeah, this kind of works. So when harm, before harm happens, there's not necessarily equity or equality in our society, you know, different people, if my hands represent different people might have access to more resources. And that's a different kind of justice. And, and it's not the one that I, that I wanna talk about in the moment, but before there's harm, we can, we can sort of say there's justice in, the same, in that sense, that there's no harm done. And if this person harms this one, we can represent it by 
you know, by me lowering my hand. You know, this person has been diminished in some way. Their property was taken. Their physical body was harmed. Uh, their emotional state was harmed, right? And so our criminal justice system, our conventional justice system is traditionally try to restore justice, try to get justice by asking the, the fundamental questions for this person who did, who did the harm. What rule was broken? Of course, who broke the rule? And what's the appropriate punishment? The punishment must fit the crime, right? In order to sort of lessen this person so now we have justice again. And restorative justice essentially tries to do the exact opposite. Rather than imposing justice by um, in some ways imposing suffering, restorative justice says, how can we make things right? How can we restore the person who was harmed and elevate them back so that, <clears throat> excuse me, so that uh, we can have a sense of justice again. So that's a second way. And then a third way that I like to talk about restorative justice is kind of in a diff definitional way. Um, because restore is a word that I think most of us probably have a pretty good working definition of. But we think of restore typically the way we think about restoring classic automobile, uh, right? Which is to bring it back to the way it used to be when it was, when it was brand new. But that's not necessarily what we want to do in restorative justice because the way things used to be are sometimes quite bad, right? And why would we want to restore, why, do we, why would we want to bring things back to, to a bad state? So there's another definition. I, I want to make sure I kind of highlight this distinction, which is that, you know, if I, if I trip and fall and then I, I write myself, I, we can talk about that as, as restoring, like becoming upright, um, restoring balance. Um, and I think that's closer to, to what the philosophy and the vision of restorative justice is. It's to make things upright, or, or if you like, a shorter version, which is just to make things right. Um, and then there's just one other story, um, and it's, it, it, it's, again, a story. And, and again, I like to do it um, if I was standing in front of you in a room, and I would start to walk away from you, and there are walls and rooms. Um, we can imagine that I have superpowers and I can walk through that wall and just sort of keep walking away from you. And if I wanted you to continue to be able to hear me, I would need to increase the volume of my voice to compensate for the distance. So isn't it interesting that we've all had the observation, that we've all seen how people who are talking to each other when they're in conflict will often begin to raise their voice, to raise their volume, even though the physical distance between them has not changed at all. But the phenomenon is the same, right? It's people having the experience of not feeling heard and raising their voice literally sometimes to compensate for that sense of not feeling heard on an emotional level. And sometimes, as my father used to do, when I, when I lived, when I was little and lived at home, my father would get silent, would get quiet. And when he got, when he was upset and the quieter he got, the more my mom and I understood that he was upset. And that was his way, metaphorically, obviously now of turning up the volume. And so I just want to acknowledge that this is what happens kind of in an interpersonal, you know, like having the momentary experience of not feeling heard. And then what happens if an individual has had the experience of not feeling heard, not for a few moments, uh, but for years or decades? And what happens when an individual is part of social groups that have had the collective experience of not feeling heard, not for years or decades, but in the case of American history for hundreds of years. And then I want to keep in mind that, that another way of turning up the volume, and I want to be clear on this because, because you know, I'm going to start to talk about violence and I, I want to be clear that violence has 
a variety of different causes. But we can start to think of some types, some expressions of violence as a kind of turning up the volume. So Martin Luther King said, riots are the language of the unheard. And I think he was exactly right. And if you're with me so far, and, and it's like, it's not the way that I grew up thinking about violence. It's not the way that I grew up thinking about conflict. But if you're with me so far, if, if I'm kind of making a logical argument, then what is the safest thing that we can do in response to conflict? And we're not really set up to have a conversation, um, but I'm hoping that the answer that's coming to you is that the safest thing we can do is some form of engaging the conflict, some form of walking towards it with the goal of understanding it, some, some sense of listening to the information and the message that conflict brings to us, because it does have a message. The message is that something really important is not working. So that's what restorative justice is. It's a way of engaging conflict. It's a way of listening to the important information that the conflict has for us. Um, and it's a way of figuring out um, how, to, how to work with it. Um, it's not a restorative justice. It's not a conflict avoidance system. It's not a conflict suppression system. It's ultimately, if it's working well, it's a conflict engagement system. And then the last thing that I want to say is, is that it, it gets a little confusing. And I think that you know, some of what we're seeing from folks who are identifying more with transformative justice speaks to this because sometimes restorative justice is, is talked about as a, as a philosophy, you know, as shared values, and it is that. And sometimes people talk about it as a kind of spiritual practice you know, that, that they want to orient themselves in their relationships you know, with restorative values and it becomes kind of, you know, reminders of how they want to live in the world. And it is that too. At the same time, it is also systemic. Um, you know, so, and by system, I mean here, collective agreements. And this is, this is what uh, uh, Judge uh, Xi'an was talking about. Uh, collective agreements about what we're going to do as a collective, as a community, as an organization, uh, as a um, as a school, what are we going to do when conflict emerges? Because we know that it will. So I will stop there and hand it off to Michelle. Um, thank you. Checking the time, so I'll because um, um, I can go on and on and on and on. Um, so stop me. Um, it's hard to follow uh, these two voices because there are wise voices in this area. So, and I'm so glad to see um, Judge Colleen again. My name is Michelle Day. I am an attorney. I am a minister. I am a former um, community organizing um, uh, practitioner. And I am also a restorative justice practitioner. I say all of those things because it has been a journey bringing me to this point. There is a book written uh, called Conversations with Ogotomaletti in which a um, European uh, 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 researcher um, visited the Dogon people and was amazed about how much of community operation took place in circles. So there were um, community circles where people would just come together to talk. They would come together to um, address issues. They would come together to address conflict. But the way of life was to be in relationship with each other. So fast forward a little bit. Um, that way of life with the Dogon people um, in Africa and um, that way of life with many indigenous um, communities um, is a way of life that says that restorative, that, that, that says being in right relationship is something that we do as a way of life all day, every day, and not just as a um, um, 
response to conflict, but as a way in, in uh, relating to each other so that when conflict happens, we're already in relationship, we're already able to address um, the issues. So if I can share the screen a bit, because in order to keep me on track, I, I often use um, um, PowerPoint. But I will say fast forward um, to uh, the, the, the um, what, 90s, when um, one of our um, gurus, Howard Zare, um, thought there has to be a better way of dealing with um, the criminal justice system. And in looking for a better way, um, those who gave birth to the um, term restorative justice looked at uh, alternatives to punishment that incorporated the type of community um, practices that I um, just named. And in doing that, um, they, the, 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 some people would say that it was co-opted. I say it was adapted, okay? And in doing that, they made use of those indigenous practices in a way that became important for the, for the criminal justice system. I kind of uh, like to look at the um, uh, 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 fable about the elephant and the people who couldn't see all parts of the elephant. So the person who touched the tail thought that, oh, this is a rope. And the person who touched the um, body thought, oh, this is a tank, whatever. But that's exactly how restorative justice shows up. The entire body of the elephant is building and maintaining right relationships. It is the I am because we are. We're all together in this. But a portion of that elephant may be the ears, you know, so just like a port and just like a portion of building and maintaining right relationships is the um, court system and how the court system um, uh, adapts these practices. A portion of it may be within the school system and how the school system adapts these practices. Another portion may be um, how law enforcement adapts these practices, but it's all about understanding that we are in community together and we have to be in right relationship. So I um, wanted to just go over a few things. We talk about um, the processes, we talk about the, the, the structures, we talk about so many things, but it really just boils down to this. And this is one of my favorite sayings. If you want to build a ship, don't herd people together to collect wood. Don't assign them tasks and work, but teach them to long for the immensity of the sea. That's what we have to do. We have to teach people to long for being in right relationship. And when we do that, then it doesn't matter what the setting is, we use the practices to be in right relationship. And so when I talk about restorative justice, I talk about it in terms of it has its purpose in first building community, but then also in um, engaging in ways to restore community when there are issues. Having said that, we have to understand that there are um, underlying barriers to being in right relationship. One of them, of course, is natural conflict. Another one is trauma. And trust me when I say, um, the, 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 well, don't trust me, but experts have, have um, included the fact that trauma includes historical traumas. Historical traumas like long-term racism, long-term uh, um, uh, long sexism, those types of things. But also 
barriers to being in right relationship is systemic and structural inequity. The isms that we're dealing with. Restorative justice has a way of being able to deal with all of them. But first of all, we have to understand a couple of things about um, conflict. And conflict is, um, we have to understand that it's not inherently unhealthy. It's a change agent that moves people forward. So that, and it, it, it comes from the fact that people have a diversity of perspectives, a diversity of perspectives. That's natural conflict. So when you look at the diversity of perspectives and you look at the fact that one person, this, this um, um, diagram represents one person. <laughs> one person can have a, diver, uh, a perspective that is based upon their age, their race, their ethnicity, their personality, their marital status. They bring all of those different perspectives to the table. So if that's the case, then you really cannot define reaching peace or being in right relationship as being the absence of conflict. Because with all those different perspectives coming to the table from one person, I can be in conflict all by myself in a room, all by myself. So where we um, um, make our mistakes regarding restorative justice is looking at restorative justice as being peacekeepers rather than peacemakers. The peacekeepers try to keep the lid on the conflict by any means necessary and maybe deal with um, the conflict as it happens. That's where you get your alternatives to punishment. But the peacemaker is seeking truth and reconciliation by looking for the heart of the issue and clearing the way for working through conflict. It builds relationships that allow for healthy responses to future conflict. So that brings me to the definition that we're talking about in terms of restorative justice. It emphasizes building those type of interpersonal community and systemic relationships, which prevent, remember we said building relationships first, or repair unjust behavior through collective efforts. It's a way of life living together. So if we're saying that, then you look at the four key values of RJ and you look at the fact that there always has to be encounter. There has to be truth telling. There has to be accountability where each person takes responsibility for the health of the relationship, the health of the community by, by first of all, telling the, the truths that need to be there needs to be inclusion. Everybody who's affected by the situation needs to be included in the discussion, in the, um, in the um, building of relationship. And then there needs to be reintegration, or what I call mercy. You know, how are you going to, after you talk about things, there will always be hurt feelings. There will always be um, um, reasons why you have to keep connecting people. So none of this is linear, even though it's shown as linear on the screen. It's a circular thing that keeps happening. The truth telling keeps happening and it's happening through storytelling. It's I'm telling my story, you're telling your story. But it's, and, and the accountability keeps happening. It's all circular. Now, this is the, the biggie that I was trying to get to quickly. Um, the reason why we say that this is a totally different way of thinking and being in our society is because restorative justice, as it was practiced by our ancestors, as it is hopefully practiced now, um, requires that we not do the um, same thing that we're always used to doing, especially those of us who are attorneys, um, and that is jumping to addressing the issue. As I said before, since I'm coming to the table with a different perspective about the issue than you are, then um, we cannot just jump to addressing the issue. What the, the, the um, ancestral way of defining restorative justice is, is that you first get acquainted with each other. You spend time getting acquainted and talking about your stories. 
then you build the relationship in a way in which you understand what each other needs to feel brave and safe in addressing issues. Then you develop um, action plans to deal with them. And there are many restorative justice practices. We talked about the, 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 the philosophy, which had those um, four key values. We talked about the process, which is balancing the process. But then there are many practices, the peace circles being one, restorative conversations where, you know, once I get out of the peace circle, I need to have a way of talking to each other in order to um, uh, keep the relationship strong and going. Community service, conferencing, you know, where you sort of do shuttle diplomacy between um, um, parties to, to find out what their issues are before you bring them together in circle. Truth and Reconciliation Commissions and um, Asset Mapping and Community Organizing are just some um, parts of, of related practices that build right relationships. And there can be, uh, when we talk about peace circles, uh, the, the, the granddaddy of peace circles to me is the talking circle because you're honestly looking at being in relationship before anything happens but you also have community building, celebration, planning, conflict, and healing. The, 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 the elements of all of our practices are sharing with each other the behavioral guidelines that make us feel safe and say, feel brave in telling those stories that need to be told and then adhering to all of those processes. The balance in the process, getting acquainted before you start trying to address the issue. And I think uh, Judge Sheehan spoke before about time. This is not things that you can do in a um, short period of time. It takes time because it's a way of life. You spend time doing it. But in order to create an avalanche of, of, of community that has the capacity to hold those right relationships. You have to create a restorative environment internally and externally. That means everybody has to be educated about it. Everybody who's gonna to touch a community or situation needs to be educated. We have to build relationships in a way in which you are able to address situations. And I'm gonna come out of this for just a second and um, uh oh, and um, deal with the last parts of what I wanted to say. Um, there are stages for the type of transformation that we talk about. Those stages begin with education, letting people know what exactly is RJ, how does it apply to my setting. Remember we said that elephant, there's different settings. There's the court, there's the community, there's the school, there's everything. So how does it apply to my setting? Then getting people trained so that you have people in their own setting who can um, spread this um, um, education so that it flows like water throughout their entity. But after that training, there's the implementation process. How do you actually implement it within the the um, entity in a way that has integrity so that they can move out with it. And now, and then there's advocacy and finally um, um, collaboration. And I'm gonna illustrate for you how that, that happens. Um, when Nehemiah first went into the schools, one of the schools that we went into was York High School in Cook County Jail. We started by educating the leadership. We started by um, educating the teachers about RJ. And then we trained some of them. And then in that training, we helped them to implement the processes. And in that implementation, we were having circles with the young men and women who are incarcerated in Cook County Jail. Well, even though I am an attorney, I did not realize that people had been in jail for four or five years without ever having had a trial. That's why you have a high school there because those kids are, are in, were in jail um, waiting for a trial and they were there because they couldn't afford bail. 
So that led some of us to uh, remember I said the next step can be advocacy. What we learn from being in relationship with each other that needs to change systems and change structures um, can grow into restorative advocacy. We became what was called the In Money Bail Coalition, working together to end um, the, the injustice of money bail. And it, it was an amazing thing because when I said it takes all of the community, it takes all of the community, not just the community organizers, but um, our own uh, Judge Evans, um, Tony Preckwinkle, you know, we're all saying the same thing. Like, this is not just, there has to be a better way to deal with this. And so this is restorative justice in action, changing hearts, changing minds, changing systems and structures. Um, and then I will finally um, talk from the faith-based standpoint of view. Um, I work uh, for the, um, in, in what I call in, in, my, in my job, I work for the um, circuit court in the resource section, connecting restorative justice across the city. And um, luckily that also includes what I do in my ministry because I connect faith-based institutions. One of the things that I realize is that um, this work requires us to sow seeds. Okay, requires us to sow seeds, but we can only sow those seeds. From my faith uh, tradition standpoint of view, then we have to rely upon a higher power to bring about the harvest of those seeds that we're sowing. So each one of us has a duty wherever we are, whatever um, um, entity we're working within to sow those seeds. And I'm proud to be on this um, panel with um, Colleen and with Mikhail. I'm proud to um, work in the trenches with um, uh, Judge Hall that you'll hear about later oh, and Judge, Judge Evans. And um, um, I just sow, sow seeds, that's all we can do. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle, very much. We're running a little behind, so I'm not going to say much, but uh, I think we are off to an excellent start. Uh, thank you, Judge Sheehan and uh, Colleen, Mikhail, Mich uh, Michelle. Thank you so much. I think you have put us in the space where the uh, to set the tone for the rest of the day.